Tonight, as we begin our Good Friday service, I want to confess to you that I have an agenda in regards to this service specifically, a different agenda than any other service that I've ever been to or preached at. It seems that across the world, not just our nation, but that across the world, when it comes to Good Friday and the crucifixion story that you just heard about, we, we, we celebrate it, but we more just acknowledge it on our way to Easter. This is why we only had to do one Good Friday service here, and we have to do three Easter. Because people have a hard time with what you just saw. It's, it's conflicting. It's bothersome. It, it, it stirs something within my heart that I don't really like, and I don't really know why I don't like it. And so my agenda today with you after a year within Kesed of talking about emotional health, after a year within Kesed of talking about being fully present, is this. It's to anchor your Easter season in Good Friday. And anchors are difficult, usually rusty things. They're kind of loud. We don't let kids play with them. We throw them into the deep dark, and we wait for them to tug on something in order to do what? In order to stop us. But in order to stop us, they first have to slow us. And so my agenda this Good Friday is to slow you down so that you can stop and acknowledge just what the cross accomplished so that Easter can mean everything it's supposed to. This is what's been laid on my heart. This is, is not something that, that I learned in a book or saw in a how to do great Good Friday services manuals. This is just something I've prayed about with our church at this time that I feel like God is giving us, that I feel like God is blessing us with. And so that's the prayer I'm going to pray over you right now. That this service, this, this next few moments, anchors not just your Easter season, but your whole life in the meaning of the cross and its purpose for your story. Because I'm here to tell you today, without it, you will meander through the seas of this world, tossed about, for Jesus and the story of the cross is what causes us to be able to be still and be present and recognize the power that we're going to celebrate on Easter Sunday. So will you pray with me? Will you join with me in that agenda, just proclaiming, Heavenly Father, Lord, there's all kinds of people here from all kinds of different stories, and that means the cross has to impact them in all kinds of different ways. My hope is, Lord, that today they would hear from you, not from me, not not from uh, anything that might distract them or keep them from being impacted by the story of your cross, but that, Lord, they would hear truly from your Spirit in areas of their life they've been lifting up, in areas of their life they've been hiding, in areas of their life they've been exposing, in areas of their life they've been protecting. God, in all manners and feelings and places, May the cross impact them like it has so many so that come that resurrection, it will have so much more meaning. Thank you, God, for tonight, for this place, and for these people. We lift it all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if you happen to be a guest, which isn't usual, uh, not a lot of people get invited to Good Friday services as their first time to guest it, but... I got to do it. I'm Danny, one of the pastors here, and excited you're here if you're brand new and have never been here before. I'm going to share with you today, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what I'm calling uh, celebration of the cross. And I realize it's a, it's a weird word, but I think, I think it's important, and I think that it fits really, really well, this whole idea that we are to be people who celebrate the cross. Now, the first thing I want to do is recognize the awkwardness that I talked about in just a moment ago, this idea that everyone has an inner problem with the cross, that when you see the videos and when you, when you really talk about the details of the crucifixion, some of which was laid out there, uh, it, it bothers something inside your heart, something inside your story, and I think, to be honest, it's supposed to. I just think, also to be honest, that you're supposed to sit in it anyways, as a matter of fact, that's why some of us have such difficult marriages or difficult relationships with our children or don't have very good employment records. It's because we don't sit in difficult very easy. So maybe start tonight. Sit in some difficult without 
being distracted or soothing yourself with something else, your phone or your mind or what you're going to be doing afterwards, really truly sit in what, what psychologists today call the big now. Feel the sweat on your hands. Feel your pants. Feel the temperature in the room. Decide whether or not you like the lighting or if the set suits you. I don't know. But take it all in and absorb it and be in the presence. I think the cross doesn't fit into our picture of how things are supposed to be. We hear a Savior's coming. He's supposed to save. He's not supposed to get crucified and killed. As a matter of fact, it's never fit into anyone's picture. And it's always been uncomfortable, and it's always been difficult. So if you're here today because I think the Holy Spirit brought you, you might think you're here because a friend brought you, or you happen to be in town from work, or, or you, you, you get to do uh, uh, Friday night services because you work every weekend. I, I think all those things are wonderful, but don't that, let that be your excuse for be, not being impacted. Because the reality is the Holy Spirit brought you here today, and he wants to share something with you. And that something is that the cross is always going to and always has made people uncomfortable. It's difficult. Matthew 16, 21 through 25 is a great example of this. It says, From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And then on the third day, be raised. Just leave it there. He's giving them foresight into what's happening because he knows when it's going to happen, it's not going to fit into their perfect little life of what they think should be. So he's sharing with them his closest confidants, the people he's intimate with, this is what's going to happen and it's going to be uncomfortable and it's going to be ugly and it's going to be difficult and it's going to be a trial. And they're like, no, nah, I, don't, I don't think that's a good idea. I think we should, we should change the plans. You're saying that's where it's going to happen. Why don't we just do something else? And Jesus is like, no, you, you don't understand. That's what's supposed to happen. And it says T Peter took him aside. Because you don't really want to backtalk Jesus in front of anybody. Peter's like, can I? Which I still think takes quite a, quite of a, a masculine presence to say, Jesus, can I, can I step outside and talk to you for a second? I, I heard what you said, but I, I, I don't really know if, 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 if it's right. He, he's, he's pretty respectful. He says, uh, far be it from me, Lord. Far be it from me. Lord, this shall never happen to you. So he starts off with like this really respectful, hey, just forgive me for what I'm about to say, but that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen to you. But Jesus immediately turns to Peter and says to him, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Now, do you understand what he's saying is the things I just shared with you, Peter, are the things of God. The ugly things, the difficult things, the, the trial and the torture and the, 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 the exposure and the humiliation. All of these things Jesus is proclaiming to Peter are the things of God. And they're difficult enough without you, Peter, a good Christian, telling me I shouldn't have to go through them. Now, I don't know how well that relates to your Christian upbringing or if you've ever been around Christians who try to tell you that everything in your life should be wealthy and healthy and wise. If you follow Jesus, but that's nowhere in the Bible. It doesn't say if you follow Jesus and have faith that you'll never have trials or you'll never be sick or you'll never miss a mortgage payment. It doesn't say that. Peter wished it said that. And if Peter was here, he'd probably pull me aside and say, hey, can I talk to you for a second? Far be it for me. But I don't think that should happen. For if you're following Jesus, Jesus should lead you to good things. But that would be the old Peter, not the new Peter. The Peter that was rebuked by Jesus, the Peter that was rebuked by the words of God himself when he said, I am about my father's business, and guess what? My father's business is difficult and bloody and hard. If you are about God's business, let me just tell you right now, it's going to cost you something. Stop avoiding paying the payment. Embrace the power of the cross Stop pulling Jesus aside spiritually. And I think some of you do this, and you're probably a little more respectful than, 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 than uh, Peter. You do it through your prayers. You're like, excuse me, Jesus, I know you got a lot going on. Dealing with some stuff in my life. You may not have noticed because I realize you got a lot of people you deal with. <laughs> if you could go ahead and deal with this situation that I've got, this person at work, if you could just, they don't love you, so if you could just get rid of them. 
They don't, or this situation, this person who hurt me, if you could just minimize them in my, in my life, God, I appreciate that. And then a month goes by, a two months goes by, three months go by, and then you get a little more like, hey, Jesus, I realize uh, I prayed pretty calmly last time. Maybe I didn't emphasize my points well enough. This person needs to go away. This situation needs to go away. This difficulty needs to go away. Or you and me, we're going to have bigger problems than I can care to share right now. I mean, I'm trying to be respectful. A few months go by, and by that time, you're like, I'm thinking about walking away, God. This is so much our story. And so much of it is because we're not anchored in the cross. And we don't see that even for Peter himself, the one who was the rock that Jesus built the church upon, the cross wasn't anchored in his story like it should have been. At least not yet. Jesus goes on in that same passage to tell his disciples. And this, by the way, moves downstream to all of us. For we are all called, if we are followers of Jesus, to be his disciples. So don't have the excuse uh, that, that God's only talking to Peter right here. He's ta- or his, his select uh, uh, 11. Right? He's talking to all of us. This is what he says to all of his disciples and to you today. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself or herself. And take up his cross or her cross and follow me. For whoever would save his or her life will lose it. But whoever loses his or her life for my sake will find it. You're not going to be able to escape this. You can try to cut bait, move on to a different river. But I'm just here to tell you all of your lifeboats need an anchor. And that anchor has always been the cross. Jesus wants you to know that it's difficult He wants you to know that this idea will bother you. It always has bothered you. It doesn't mean we don't go, and it doesn't mean we don't show. It just means that Jesus himself is the one who has to make it happen. It's this specific idea within Good Friday that causes so much of us to have concern with our faith and with God. This idea, and I'll put it on the screen, that true power and wisdom often looks like sacrifice and suffering for others. True power and wisdom often looks like sacrifice and suffering for others. It, it, when God blesses you with power and wisdom, oftentimes you are sacrificing for other people in your life, for other people in your story. It's not so that you can raise yourself up all Napoleonic and in charge of everyone's well-being. You don't want to be God anyways, trust me. You can barely run your own life. Respect. <laughs> the cross empowers us into this reality And it bothers us that this is what the ultimate wisdom and the ultimate power looks like. It looks ugly. This picture of Jesus hanging on the cross appears to be an almost total contrast and a brutal denial of everything he had done before that in his story. So much of the other stuff in his story, he was winning. At least in my world, it's winning. Like they were poor and he like, he like made gold happen out of a fish and they were hungry and he made bread happen and somebody was sick and he healed them and somebody smart came up and said something and Jesus said something even smart. I love those stories. That's the Jesus I want to follow. That's the Jesus I think I most of the time anchor my life in if I'm being honest. I want to be the smartest one in the room even if it's just humble smart. Yeah, a bunch of people just heard some truth. They're like, oh, oh, I need to take down that Facebook post real quick, but he told me not to mess with my phone. Uh, I understand. I understand. Because you want to wait for someone to say something silly so you can say something smart, something smart but humble. Makes them look foolish, but you still get to look holy. <laughs> it's getting real in here, I'm telling you. This picture of Jesus on the cross It doesn't fit in that picture. It doesn't fit in that idea of what I'm about, or at least what I hope I'm about. Jesus, he's not supposed to look like that. Still today, people have problems with this, just like they did back then. Back then, it was those who had seen his power that wondered why he seemed powerless at his greatest need and so turned away. It was those who saw saw his intelligence that wondered how someone so smart could miscalculate so badly. How could he have not known this was going to happen if he came to Jerusalem? What a fool. He had to know the church was coming after him. What an idiot. I thought he was brilliant. But really, he was just thick in the head. This is, of course, because both sides missed what Jesus and his father were really saying. 
Back in those earlier days, in the heydays of his ministry, he'd drop these little bombs that people would go like, well, okay, and then they'd move on. Little bombs like this one, John 12, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you. He even said truly, truly twice to emphasize something I'm about to say to you is, guess what? True. True. <laughs> yeah, you guys are theologians. <laughs> truly, truly, I say to you. This is what he says. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And people are like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> you know they were. They were like, is he teaching us how to make bread right now? I don't know. Can I, can I call bread into existence? Because that would be awesome. But he's not, is he? He's preparing people for the anchor of the cross and its true meaning. As a matter of fact, if you really go back and look at the person of Jesus, you'll come to realize this, that it's not just his words, it's his very life that is a parable. It's not just his teachings, it's who he was. People still miss this today. Some of you are here right now. The religious-minded people in the room, you want miracles and power. You want to show that God is working in your life and other people's lives, and so you, you wave miracles and power around to, to claim the manifestation of God's glory in your life, in my life, and everybody's life, and you judge the holiness of a church based on its miracles and power. The intellectually minded people in the room, you want wisdom and truth. You want to be able to outthink people, outlogic people. And this whole faith thing doesn't really fit into your world because, well, it takes a little too much faith. In reality, you're supposed to awaken to what you have been shown. For Jesus, the Bible says, it was both his power and wisdom that led him to the cross for you. Those things you want are both sitting within the cross, hanging on the cross. This is why what God offers all of us is first the cross of Christ, because it is the miracles and power and the wisdom and truth that you so desire that the cross emphasizes. As a matter of fact, just to back this up biblically, the earliest believers actually called the cross because they understood it in hindsight, the wisdom of God and power of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 23 and 24, they describe who they preach about, but we preach Christ crucified, not just Jesus and the parable of his life, but Jesus on the cross. And this Jesus is a stumbling block to the Jews. Those are the people that are religious-minded. Those are the people that want the miracles and the power. And then they go on, and it's foolishness to the Gentiles. Those are the intellectually-minded people that want wisdom and truth. But then they go on to say, but to those whom God has called, to those who see the cross, who are anchored in its story, both Jews and Greeks, it doesn't matter if you wanted foolishness or wisdom or if you wanted power or, or, or weakness, whatever you want, it says Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. It says he is both the power and the wisdom of God on that cross, and he can answer both camps, specifically right where they are, no matter what you're looking for. But it won't be found in his stories as much as it will be found in the cross. As Christians, missing this can still be a stumbling block for us today because we prefer not to dwell on such things. After all, who respects suffering? When's the last time you heard someone boast in their suffering for God? Maybe this is why we're in such a hurry to rush Jesus up to heaven on Easter and skip through this whole muddy, mucky, bloody Good Friday thing. And yet, it's only through the power of the cross that God is so highly glorified. I love this quote regarding the cross and its power. It says, things are always darkest just before they go pitch black. And in the blackness of the truth, the truth that our own power or smarts are never enough, we discover that we need to rely solely on the promise of the Father. You cannot discover... I cannot discover that I am powerless until I'm powerless. Because as long as I have power in my hands and in my mind, as long as I'm in control, I will never release control. It is only when I stand against the backdrop of the cross and Christ's blood shedding down and I imagine his eyes staring upon me as that song we sang, it was me who nailed him there, the love for me that kept him there. It is only when I can embrace this fully and completely that I can truly feel the powerlessness of my own position and so instead cry out to him for the salvation he promises. 
truly celebrating Good Friday represents the beginning of that understanding. Good Friday, I'll put it up, provides the opportunity to proclaim, this is what it does, that I've been to the cross and now everything has changed. I've been to the cross and now everything has changed. You see, the cross both changed and changes everything. Stumbling blocks and foolishness turn into power and wisdom. Lost or found, those in bondage are broken and released into a new life. Those addicted are set free. Those searching are found. We could go on and on and on with the power of the cross and the fact that it changes everything. In this sense, I want you to consider today, if you're in the big now, if you're processing this with me, if you're really truly present and your heart's kind of beating and you're trying to figure out just where you measure up with the cross, I'll just let you know it's not very high. And that's okay. Because if you think you measure up, you've not even started the journey yet. Once you begin to realize that the cross is something that promises the beginning, the cross is not something we skip to to get to the beginning, which is Easter. It is the cross where it all starts. Then change can begin to happen in your life. And if that is so true, then you must realize this. If nothing is changing in your life, if you are the same Christ follower that you were last year as you are today, then maybe you haven't been to the cross. Maybe you've not gone. Maybe this is all just a big game to you. And you're just trying to see how many Easter services you can go to this week to impress the person that you're with. I don't know. Maybe you don't even know. How scary is that? But God knows. And he invites you to be present in the story of his cross so that that thing inside you that keeps running, that thing inside you that keeps hiding, that thing inside you that disappears, that you feel yourself put a mask on when it starts to get too uncomfortable or too ugly or too intimate. That thing inside you, Jesus says, he wants to replace it with his love, with his sacrifice, and with his cross. Easter is indeed about the empty tomb, but I'm here to tell you right now, it's first about the cross. For Friday dying is the road to Sunday living. You don't get to live on Sunday unless you die on Friday. Tell that to the other two-thirds of this church. Oh. <laughs> I just offended two-thirds of my church in one statement. Is this going to go on the video? It, we'll post it late. We'll post it late. I know this is the truth. I know this is the truth, for it was the road for Jesus. And if it's the road for Jesus, then it's got to be the road for us. It's always been this road. It was uncomfortable for Peter. It was uncomfortable for the disciples. It was uncomfortable for Paul and everyone that followed. It's uncomfortable for me, and it's supposed to be uncomfortable for you. So what? So what? Marriage is uncomfortable. Raising kids is uncomfortable. Being a good citizen is uncomfortable. Being a good person is uncomfortable. Get uncomfortable. Sit a little longer in line. Next time you're behind some really old person, just imagine it's your favorite grandma or grandpa, and then back up a little bit and chill out. Let's be uncomfortable together. And maybe that's why the cross is so difficult these days, because people are so about fast, and friendly all the time. Maybe it's supposed to be uncomfortable. I want to give you three ways that I've been doing this in my own life and that I'm doing this week so that this Easter for me is different. Three ways that I'm allowing the cross to impact me. The first way is to recognize that the cross wasn't suffered for someone else. Stop making it so generalized. Stop making it for everybody but you. No, it's for you and your problems just as they are. And all of them, not just the ones you've told people about. Second, realize how personal the message of the cross actually is. It is intimate. It is close. It's so close that if you really stop and think like you are right now, time will move slowly. You may even stop for a second. Stop running. Stop hiding. Stop pretending. I don't know. But stop. Lastly, feel it. Feel the cross's value washing over all aspects of your being. Feel what it means. 
Feel what he did. Feel what it cost him. So that you could hear this message today and still choose to ignore it. Jesus Christ died on a cross for you. And yes, he rose from the dead, and I'm telling you what, we are going to preach it, and God is going to be glorified, and people are going to meet him. But all of that wouldn't happen without the cross. And so today, I'm going to give you an opportunity to recognize the cross wasn't for someone else, to realize how personal the message of the cross actually is, and to feel the cross's value washing over all aspects of you as I read Isaiah chapter 53, which is a prophecy about this time in Jesus' life. It was like a description before the storm so that people who were in the storm and that people after the storm didn't get caught up in what happened after it was gone, but really saw what was going on within that moment in the world. And then after I read that, we're going to pass communion. Communion is a chance for you to respond to the power of the cross. And you'll be passed uh, a tray, and on the tray will be small cups of red juice, and this cup is to represent the shed blood of Jesus, and there'll be small pieces of broken bread, and this bread is to represent the broken body of Jesus. And I'm going to ask when you get that cup and you get that bread that you hold those in your hands. You don't take them yet. You just feel them. And not for their, their coldness or their softness, but for what they represent. You imagine that, that that juice is the blood of Jesus warm and dripping to the ground. You imagine that that bread is his body stripped and torn naked. You let it be held in your hands. There's a reason we take communion, people. There's a reason Jesus said, take it in your hands. Because it is embracing the cross of Christ. It is holding it in your hands and experiencing it more than just in your religion or in your tradition. But it is embracing it inside your soul. We're going to sit in that moment. We're going to feel that moment and it's going to be uncomfortable. Some of you are going to cry. Cry. Some of you are going to not want to look up. Then don't. Some of you are going to want to sit down. Some of you are going to want to stand on the back wall. Some of you are going to want to stand do whatever you need to do to feel that moment and to not avoid this discomfort and to be in the presence so that you can experience the beauty, the power, and the meaning of the cross. This is all for you. My hope is today that you will both see and feel that. Isaiah chapter 53 says, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. And we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, on him, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and for his gener generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land and the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, 
and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Heavenly Father, as we sit inside this moment and embrace your story, embrace your cross, we are thankful, God, for its meaning in our life. May it impact us. May it stir us deeply within. May we not avoid the discomfort that we feel. May we sit in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Tremble, tremble. 